Hello and welcome to Sunday Night Stories. I'm Emily Wilden, and each week myself and other artists will be narrating stories from new and talented writers. For more information on how to listen, submit a story, or as an artist, please visit the Sunday Night Stories Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at Sun Night Stories. And don't forget to subscribe right here on YouTube. To Have One Kiss Written by Caris Clark Narrated by Emily Wilden Chapter 1 The glasses were clinking, the laughter was light, and the general hub of the cross on a Friday night was one of happy banter. Tonight it was louder, it was happier. Well, the three girls in the corner were certainly celebrating in carefree abundance anyway. They were beautiful girls, not drop-dead with fake hair and other unmentionables, but natural. All slim, attractive girls, and they were on their way to being the wrong side of Mary, but not quite there yet. Jaeger shots is what we need, said Maudie, banging her hands on the table in a decisive manner. She was the youngest of the girls, Bonnie's sister, and the most outlandish. She ventured out with Bonnie and Carrie on high days and holidays, when there was a party for a good time to be had. She was a bit of a wild child at heart, and definitely the most glamorous of the three. Her motto, she would die with a makeup brush in hand and curl in hair. She wasn't vain, but she knew what God had given her, and she knew how to use it. Oh, I think I've had enough, Maud, said her sister with a bit of a grimace. She knew she would get a backlash for saying it. Although sisters, they looked nothing alike. Maudie had an abundance of dark, curly hair that she liked to style into thick, chunky, I-was-born-this-way waves. She had a pout to die for and the most amazing green eyes. When she walked into the room, the room stopped. Bonnie was blonde with straight hair down to her waist that couldn't hold a curl for love no money, with the palest blue eyes and paler skin. And although both sisters were slim, Bonnie was tiny, the kind of tiny that made you want to pick her up and put her in your pocket and keep her safe. That's how her and Carrie became friends four years ago in high school. Bonnie had been cornered by a group of girls, Carrie came along in purple Dr. Martins, ripped Levi's, black eyeliner and a face that said, Speak to me and you die. It was a look she had cultivated well over her teenage angst years. She was dark-haired, naturally curly, not Maudie's glorious waves. These were unruly buggers that back in high school were tamed by the dreaded moose. That was by no means like today's standards. It was the kind that made your hair crisper than a prawn cracker, and yet managed to make it frizzy at the same time. Thankfully, Moose has evolved a lot over the last few years. The gang that had gathered around Bonnie soon disbanded when Carrie walked through them and stood by her, and said, Everything okay, Bee? At that given moment, Bonnie didn't know who to be more afraid of. Scary Carrie, or the whole group of year eights. Um, yep, fine, she whispered. And girls, we all good, I take it, said Carrie, taking a menacing step towards the leader of the gang. She cocked her curly, crispy head to the side. It was more of a threat than a question. Yeah, we're good, Carrie, she muttered, as they shuffled their feet and walked off. Carrie stood with Bonnie till they were out of sight. Then she turned and laughed, 
and slapped a still-scared stiff Bonnie on the shoulder. Thank Christ for that. I was crapping myself. Bonnie stared at her. What? Bonnie asked. Hell yeah, said Carrie. Scared stiff. I just look like I eat nails. I am a grade A wimp. But for some reason, people think I am some kind of demon goth. Seems a shame to disappoint. So I let them think it. Comes in handy. But why would you help me? Why not? Both girls stared at each other for a split second, then laughed. That was it. The start of a friendship that was to last. Well, to last till this night. Not much had changed. Carrie didn't look scary anymore. She was beautiful. Gone with the crisp, frizzy curls. In with the soft ringlets. The eyeliner was gone too. But the dockers remained. As did her protective nature of a bee. Right, girls? Jaegers it is, said Maudie, banging the tray on the table. Oh, no, groaned B. Come on, said Carrie. We are celebrating after all. New, New beginnings. beginnings. One, One, two, two three. three. The girls banged their shot glasses on the table three times and downed their drinks. I can't believe we're going to uni, said B. Well, you two are going to uni. I'm dropping out and going to work for a living laughed Maudie. Yeah, only in your dream job, you freak. Who in their right mind would want to mop up in a vet's? teased Carrie. I will be a veterinary assistant, training on the job, earning money, not getting deeper and deeper into into, into debt, debt sponging, off sponging off the system, system wasting our time wasting getting, our a, time, degree, getting blah, a degree, blah, 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 blah chipped in B and Carrie at the same time, as they had heard Maudie's speech time and time again. Yeah, well, you two are laughing now, but you won't be laughing three years from now. That's if we haven't dropped out, laughed Carrie. Anyway, said B, you won't be complaining when you come visiting and using our student discount cards, will you? Well, gotta have some perks to losing the pair of you to Liverpool. I can't believe we are both going to Liverpool together. Can you be? I know we are doing different courses, but we'll be living together. I feel like the luckiest girl alive right now. Going on an adventure with my best friend and having a sister to sponge off when money's really tight. Speaking of which, didn't you promise to get the burger and chips in Lord Sugar? Yes, I did, but I think we should have one for the frog and toad. B slammed her hand down, never one to keep up with the other two on the drink. She swayed a little to the left, then a lot to the right. No, definitely not one more. I am the oldest out of us all, and I am putting my feet down, and saying for sure, no more drinking. Carrie laughed. <laughs> B said. But she's right. I have an early start in the morning. My mum wants to take me shopping for kitchen stuff. She keeps harping on about a teapot. Yes, swayed B. You are old enough now, Carrie. You should be drinking tea. It's not got anything to do with age, Donut. It's to do with not liking tea. It's the drink of the devil. Why she thinks I need a teapot, I have no idea. I don't drink it. But even if I did... No one makes tea in a pot anymore, do they? I mean, my mum doesn't make it in a pot. She just puts bags in the cups. I think she thinks living in halls is going to be like living in Downton Abbey. Christ, you best not take her to Egbeth. She'll have a stroke. B stared into space, as if her subconscious had just voiced itself without her knowing. Carrie and Maudie just stared at her in disbelief. Shit. Slurred B. I just said that out loud, didn't I? I... I am so sorry, Carrie. Carrie looked at Maudie, and they tried not to laugh. 
held it together for about three seconds, but burst out laughing. It's okay, you pisshead, said Carrie. Anyone else had said it, and they would have gotten the full-on Carrie face. That was enough to make you whimper in a corner. It was no secret that Carrie was a bit scared to be going to uni, as in the last month her mum had been in and out of hospital suffering after a stroke. In fact, she had nearly died. Carrie had been having a hard time. Part of her wanted to stay at home and do as Maudie was doing, get a job and help support her family. But her mum had played the guilt card on her, told her that it was her greatest wish for her to go to uni and get her degree. She was so proud of her. That's all she wanted. Now Carrie just felt immense pressure for her to go for her mother. At least she had B to help her through. The high street was empty. The moon's full and low. Something strange is going to happen, said Carrie. You don't have to talk some hippie crap, sighed Maudie. It's not crap or hippie, my dad says, and he's usually right about it. The moon is scientific, you know. Yeah, when it's to do with tides and shit. Not about you feeling strange, you dippy hippie. Maudie threw a chip at her. The three girls were stood in the middle of the pedestrianised high street, which opened one way to cars at night. The street was empty, flashing lights from another pub in the middle of the town, and the boom, boom, boom of the beat of dance music was pounding out. No other people were in sight, which was strange for a Friday night. Maudie looked at her watch. What time did the taxi say it would be here, Carrie? Twelve. Why, what time are we on? Just gone twelve. Oh, I think I'm going to be sick, groaned B. You better go by the Diagon Alley. If CCTV pick you up being sick, you could get a fine. B started to sway towards the alley, when suddenly there was a screech of tyres, headlights on full beam, and an overpowering engine sound. Maudie screamed for Bonnie to move, but she was fixed to the spot. Carrie didn't stop to think. She ran out to Bonnie and reached her just in time. She pushed her with all her force. Bonnie went flying to the side of the road, banged her head and landed awkwardly on her right side. She lay lifeless on the floor. Maudie was fixed to the spot. She was shaking but she wasn't even aware that somebody was putting a coat over her shoulders, or that she was crying. She was sobbing, sobbing so bad she had fallen to her knees. The two boys in the car were ironically from Liverpool. The car was stolen. They had been joyriding. They were the same age as Maudie, seventeen, not even past their driver's licence. They turned off the A55 and headed towards the small town of Hollywell because they were hungry. The boy driving was actually a good driver. He had driven all the way from Garside without a glitch, but he headed down the one-way high street doing 40 miles an hour. It was midnight. He wasn't expecting a blonde waif to be caught in the headlights. He tried to brake. He saw the girl fly past the windscreen, remember seeing a mass of blonde hair flying, as if in slow motion, and the feeling of relief that he hadn't hit her. But then, within a millisecond, there was the sound and the feeling of impact, crumpling metal, a shrill scream slowly starting to seep over the windscreen. Carrie woke in a white room. It wasn't that the walls were painted white with a white floor. It was as though she was in a room of white light. She wasn't even sure what she was lying on. If anything, all she knew was there was white. The next time she woke, she was in a field with daisies and an old Audrey Hepburn was sat in the distance. Carrie's mouth was dry. She tried to mouth a word, 
but nothing came out. You're in a coma, she said to herself. Go back to sleep and wake when you're better. Audrey turned to her and smiled. Wow, she really was beautiful. Carrie had always been an Audrey Hepburn fan, even down to her final film, always. Yep, if God was going to have angels, they would look like Audrey Hepburn. Not necessarily the older Aud, but she wasn't just beautiful on the outside. Carrie believed her beautiful on the inside too. When I wake, I will aim to be more like Audrey Hepburn in life. With that thought, she drifted back to sleep. The next time she woke, she was in another white room, and Morgan Freeman was dressed as a janitor, mopping the floor. No, shouted Carrie, and turned her back. Morgan Freeman was God, obviously. But these dreams were making her feel like she was dead. Lol. Dead, no. I'm in a coma. I'm not dead. I'm not engaging in these dreams, she repeated to herself. No, Morgan Freeman. No, Audrey Hepburn. Icons they may be, but dead she was not. This time she woke in a bed in Glancloyd Hospital. She recognised the pattern on the curtain. It was the same when she had her tonsils out. She felt a little groggy, but nowhere hurt. That was good. She had no tubes, no wires. She struggled to sit up, but she didn't need to struggle. She managed fine. She thought there might be water on the side of the bed, but there wasn't. But then again, she wasn't thirsty. She was surprised. There was no cards or flowers in the cubicle. She looked at her arms. No cuts, no bruises. She felt her head. No, nothing there either. She felt sure there would be something on her head. How long had she been in hospital for? Maybe it had been a while. That's why the cards had gone, and the bruises. She tried to remember what happened but it was all a bit of a blur. She remembers her head on the windscreen. It went into the windscreen. It went into her face. Her hands flew to her face. No, her face felt fine. Maybe it felt worse than it actually was. This ward is quiet. She looked for a bell. You wake, darling. It was a familiar voice, but she couldn't place it. It was coming from behind the curtain. Yes, replied Carrie, in barely a whisper. Are you sure? Proper awake, like? Yeah, I think so. The curtain pulled to one side, and Kat Slater from EastEnders, dressed as a nurse, walked in. Great. You can't slip back now, you said you're awake. You've been hard one to pull over, you have. Pull over? Yeah, pull over. Cross over, pass over to the other side, whatever you want to call it. We fetched in the big guns. Audrey, Morgan. I mean, everyone thinks Morgan Freeman is either president or God. But not you, girl. You've been a nightmare to bring over. And the truth is... We are running out of time. <laughs>